we gonna wait a couple more minutes or are we starting? Oh, we can start now. You can lead this. Okay. Uh, welcome everybody to lesson 18 for the 2022 to 2023 session. This is our YouTube channel for past recordings. You can check it out. The link is right there. This is our first icebreaker of the day. What is your dream job? You can feel free to unmute or answer in the chat. Oh, I see some person saying a nurse, a businessman. What kind of businessman though? Like sales? On the business is kind of broad. There's like sales, there's stocks. Like, do you like the stock market? Okay. okay, next icebreaker. What is your favorite subject in school? Math. What category of math though? Like algebra? Geometry. So a lot of people are saying math, but like what category? Like trigonometry, calculus, statistics. Math is very broad. Okay, yeah, cool. I guess everyone just likes math. Oh, okay. Trigonometry. Yeah, trigonometry is pretty interesting. Okay, today we're going to start off with chemistry. We're going to be doing acid base reactions. Then we'll go on to history and discuss the American Civil War. And then we'll end off with physics, which is which we're going to talk about rotational kinematics. So this is chemistry, and then today it's going to be acid base reactions. Way calm, bro. Oh yeah, my bad. Um, acidity and pH. Um, okay, before we talk about acids and base reactions, we gotta discuss the pH. Basically, a value that ranges from one to fourteen. Um, I think it actually can go go lower lower than um one, right? It can go to like the negatives. Um, no, you can't have negative pH. That's for sure. Because where pH is the negative log of uh, your H plus concentrations, you can't have a negative number from a logarithm that's like already negative. Okay, okay, I bet, I bet. Okay, um, so basically, the lower the pH is, the more acidic an object is, and um, uh, pOH is the opposite of pH, and it ranges from one to fourteen, but um, pOH is um less acidity. Um, and that's because pH is four, uh, 14 minus uh, the pOH. And then um, an object with high pH would be a basic object, which is the opposite of acidity. And then water at seven, 25 degrees Celsius has a pH of seven. So yeah, water is considered neutral. Basically, pOH is just the opposite of pH. And then here's like a chart uh, from like the pHs. So actually pH can be zero, so it's a bit of an error, but it's fine. So you can see that pure water at 25 degrees is seven. And then you have things like your stomach acid, lemon juice, which is obviously acidic. Like everyone knows that. And you got like more basic things like soap, bleach, and um, NaOH, which is sodium hydroxide on the other side. And you see that as the numbers go up, it's more basic. And as the numbers go down, it's more acidic. All right, so um, acid base reactions. Uh, they're basically a chemical process where um, hydrogen ions, which are H, are exchanged between acids and bases. So, in order to remember that, you can remember the mnemonic BAAD, which is that bases accept the hydrogen ions while acids would donate them. 
And, and you can see that HCl would be the acid and NaOH would be the base. And then as you can see through the reaction, the, uh, the hydrogen ion from the hydrogen chloride would be donated and make um, the salts and water, which is the sodium chloride and H2O. Okay, next acids. They're just molecules that are capable of donating of the hydrogen proton. And they have two categories, which are strong and weak. And the strength of the acid is determined by its ability to ionize or lose a proton. Um, strong acids can fully dissociate in water, whereas weak acids only partly. And six strong acids, uh, while other, all other acids are weak. And then also a reaction between a strong acid and base will always make salt and water. And then you can see all the acids, perichloric acid, hydrochloric, et cetera, et cetera. I'll have hydrogen in it. So yeah, the six strong acids are on the table on the right. Every single other acid you encounter will most likely be weak. And the reaction we saw from the previous slide between uh, HCl and NaOH, both of those are strong and therefore you make a salt and water. We will see otherwise when you deal with weak acid and bases. And I can cover the rest from here. So bases are a molecule that are capable of accepting a proton, also known as H plus. Bases have two categories also, strong and weak, like an acid. So like an acid, bases, uh, the strength of a base is determined by its ability to ionize or gain a proton. And there's also, again, six strong bases. So yeah, acid and bases are really similar. And the six strong bases are on the right, and all other bases are weak. So if you actually look at a periodic table, it's actually pretty easy to memorize the six strong bases because it's actually the first three elements in the first column besides hydrogen. And then like the last three elements, and then like you kind of, not, not the last, but like if you connect it, it's like, you can see that calcium, strontium, barium also like in the second column, but like in a row, like, yeah. And then all of them in with hydroxide because it's base. So how do we actually get pH from an acid-base reaction? So getting the pH of the solution is probably the most important thing when dealing with acid-base reactions. A strong acid plus strong base reaction in which the acid and base are of equal concentrations will always have a pH of seven. Uh, this is because there are equal concentrations of H plus and OH as like the strong acid and strong base will like fully dissociate and lose their H plus or OH. Whatever. And then those, those H plus and OH floating in water will combine together to form H2O, which is like neutral, right? At 25 degrees Celsius. And it'll be a pH of seven. So that's why when we combine the strong acid and strong base uh, at equal concentrations, we'll always have a pH of seven. So the pH is influenced by the concentration of H plus or OH in a solution. So earlier I said that when you have a strong acid and strong base of equal concentrations, you'll have a neutral pH of seven, right? But now assume, let's assume that we have like more acid than base, right? And still both of them are strong. Then our pH would actually be lower than seven now because all of the base, like all of the OH from the base has reacted with the H plus from the acid, but there's more acid than base, which means we have more H pluses than OH minuses or like hydroxides, right? So if we have more H pluses still left over in the water, that will lower the pH of the solution and therefore give you an, uh, an acidic solution. And the opposite is true if you have more base than acid because now you have leftover OH and your pH will be high. So how do we actually calculate pH in a solution? Well, to calculate pH, we do the negative logarithm. I don't know if you all know logarithm, but if you do, then this will be simple. But it's basically the negative logarithm of the concentration of uh, protons in your solution. So assuming you know the concentration, like let's say it's like one molarity then you, of H plus, right? Then you take the negative log of that and that'll give you the pH. So, but in like, so earlier when we said we have a neutral uh, reaction where we have no um, OH or H plus, then like, yeah, then your pH would be seven. 
And then POH is like the opposite. You take the negative log of the OH this time. And then we can still use POH to find pH because pH equals 14 minus POH. So weak acid or base reaction, this is where it gets really complicated because weak acid and bases, they don't fully like dissociate, which means there will still be some of your weak acid or base left in the solution after the reaction. So when either the acid, or the base, or both are weak, the reaction becomes a lot more complicated and the products are no longer just a salt and a water, as we saw earlier when we saw NaCl plus water. This is, there is, yeah, so we don't have enough time to co cover this concept. So that's why, so it feels like an apology, I guess. So we'll probably do this like next time along with buffers, but like I can simplify it right now and give you like a kind of like a summary. So there's a concept in chemistry called equilibrium. So when you react two objects together, oftentimes you don't just immediately get the product. Like this isn't a math equation where you have one plus one equals two. This is where it's like you, re you react one and one to form two, and then two breaks down back into one and one, but not fully. So now in your final solution, you have all three of the things, or you have both products and reactants inside the solution. And that's what, that's what equilibrium is. Equilibrium is the final amount of reactants and products that you made in your reaction because not everything will be products in equilibrium. So uh, when you're doing dealing with equilibrium, you also have a variable called K. You'll see this very often. For acid and bases, it's called the acid dissociation constant, Ka, which equals the concentration of the products over the concentration of the reactants. So you would take like the concentration. So if you have an equation, right, with like an acid plus a base turns into, uh, let's say, H plus plus something else, right? Then you would take the concentration of the two or more products and then divide that by the concentration of the leftover reactants. And then you'll use something called a rice table, which is really complicated. We'll cover that next time to find the equilibrium concentration of the OH and H plus. Just know that the rice table will give you the concentration of the H plus. And then you could, and as you saw earlier, there's an equation which is pH equals negative log the concentration of H plus. And that, and then so because you know the concentration of the H plus, you can now solve for pH. I know this is really complicated. And uh, if you have any questions, like please put them in the chat. Cause like, this is like really complicated stuff. Like most people learn this stuff in like college, even in America. So dissociate is just like, it's kind of like dissolving in a sense, it's like where you're, uh, so if we go back to the example, right? Um, first equation, dissociate HCl, right? Hydrochloric acid. When it dissociates, it becomes H plus and Cl. So essentially the molecule has separated from its hydrogen uh, ion. Or if we go to the base, NaOH, the Na separates from the OH and now you have OH and Na when you can say that the base has dissociated. So it just means it's kind of like split from it's like H plus or OH minus. That's what dissociate is. Is there any other questions? I know this is like really complicated and we went a bit fast, but yeah. So to basically give like a general summary, uh, acid base reactions, we were trying to find pH from it, which tells us how acidic our final solution is. And you can do that by looking at how much H plus or OH minus is left over in your solution or like mixture, right? And that will give us the pH, which is which will tell us how acidic or basic our mixture is, which is like what's useful to us when we're doing experiments or something. Strong acid and strong base. Okay, so someone asked what's the difference between strong acid and strong base. Um, well, it's literally, it's, there's no difference. It's just, the difference is one of them's an acid, one of them's a base. 
there's only a difference between strong acid and weak acid in that strong acids fully dissociate, like they'll completely dissociate, whereas weak acids don't completely dissociate or like they don't completely split. So if you just dump a bunch of weak acid inside water, only some of that weak acid will split from its H+. Whereas if you dump a strong acid in water, all of it will split from its H+. But yeah, um, the difference between a strong acid and a strong base is just the difference between an acid and a base, which is acids donate H pluses and bases accept H pluses. So just remember the acronym BAD, bases accept, acids donate, and you'll know which what is the acid and what's the base. If there's no more questions, then we'll move on to history. Okay, well, okay, if that answers your question, okay, good. So now we're gonna be covering history and we're gonna be doing the American Civil War. Okay, so this is just a recap about the American Civil War. So the American Revolution resulted in the formation of the United States with a new democratic government and power remained in the hands of the elite. Um, other revolutions abroad occurred that were inspired by the American Revolution, such as like revolutions in Europe. Um, and the constitution was drafted that included a bill of rights and separation of powers, which were enlightenment ideas. leading up to the American Civil War. So the Civil War was caused by sectional tension over slavery um, in the North, uh, which was rapidly industrializing. Uh, they were building canals, steamboats, and railroads, which diversified the economy. Um, and in the South, the economy heavily relied on agriculture. Uh, through plantations which required slaves. Uh, the North wanted to get rid of slavery for ethical reasons, while the South wanted to keep them for economic reasons because a lot of the slaves would like pick cotton or like help with other agricultural stuff. The start of the Civil War. So the war started with the se secession of South Carolina from the United States, followed by Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Texas, Virginia, Arkansas, uh, Tennessee, and North Carolina. Um, and these states formed the Confederate States of America. Uh, the advantages of the North. So they had um, more people, approximately 21 million to the South's 9 million. So they had like over double the population of the South. And there was also more industry. The North manufactured 97% of the country's firearms, 96% um, of its railroad locomotives, 94% of its cloth and over 90% of its boots and shoes. There were also more railroads and canals in the North, uh, which allowed the people living there to move supplies and personnel at a greater pace. There was also more financial resources and the North controlled the Navy. So for the South, the advantages that they had is they could produce all the food that they needed because um, they're very agriculturally based. Um, they had more trained officers. So seven out of the eight military colleges were in the South. Um, and then they were fighting a defensive war, meaning um, they were only defending, like they weren't attacking uh, the North. So this meant that they were more familiar with the environment as the North was coming to the South to attack them. And then um, there was more morale, which was initially, because instead of, um, they were just fighting to retain their way of life, like to continue the way that 
they were living with the slaves rather than um, the North, which was trying to retain the Union. Um, so the strategy of the North um, was the Anaconda Plan, which was suggested by Winfield Scott. And um, their idea was a, a naval blockade of the South, which advanced down to the Mississippi River, uh, slowly strangling the South. Um, and this would prevent the South from getting any outside help. Um, so this, this meant that it was only like the, the South being able to defend themselves without being able to get other people to uh, join in on them. And then also the Mississippi River was the like South main way of transportation. So it would cut, cut out a lot of the things that they were transporting down. Um, and then they wanted to capture Richmond, Virginia, which was the Confederate capital. Um, and unfortunately the plan didn't really work because of the weak Navy that the North had. Um, on the other hand, the Southern strategy was just to defend their borders. They wanted to just continue the way that they were living. So their goal was to put up as much of a fight as possible. Um, and this would mean it wouldn't make conquering them would not be like as worth it because the longer that they that the fight lasted, the more resources that the North would have to be have to use on the South. So they were just trying to lengthen the amount of time that the war was taking so that the, the North would just eventually give up. So the South, like as I just said, the South wasn't trying to defeat the North. They were, they were just trying to stall out the war long enough so that the North would just uh, give up in fighting or Uh, some, some important developments was Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, where he declared that all slaves in the Confederate States of America to be free. This actually didn't really, this didn't free any slaves because uh, the, obviously the Confederate States, uh, I'll get to what happened. Because the Confederate States weren't part of the Union anymore, so they obviously didn't have to um, listen to Lincoln. Uh, but it also, but it did give a morale boost in the North because it made the war a war against slavery rather than one to preserve the Union. And then another one was the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, it destroyed the, so when Lee won a victory, he like um, became really ambitious and tried to invade the North. But at the Battle of Gettysburg, he was defeated and forced to retreat. And the Battle of Gettysburg was similar to the, um, the other battle in the, during the Revolutionary War where they tried to get out, so they tried to prove to like foreign nations that they were like a sovereign, like they were, um, they were like a self-independent country. But since they lost at the battle, battles of Gettysburg, um, they lost the the foreign nations didn't recognize them. Oh yeah, the battle of Gettysburg is probably the most important battle of the entire war, and technically the foreign recognition uh was not lost in the battle of gettysburg rather than the emancipation proclamation because britain and france were not going to help a country that's like so uh, that's like they're not going to help a country that's based on slaves opposed to like a country that's fighting for freedom because britain and france had already gotten rid of slavery All right, so the result was a Northern victory. The death toll was um, was between 520,000 and upwards of 851,000. And it was, a, it was also a transitional war. Uh, many people said that it was like the start of modern war because they used new technologies like ironclads rather than just wooden ships, as well as machine guns and uh, submarines and other things. Uh, it was the first, it was also the first war to have widespread news coverage. And after the war, slaves were freed by the 13th Amendment. And then in the 14th and 15th Amendments, they were given equal, like due process under law, as well as the right to vote. Although the Southern states kind of didn't want that, so they passed the Jim Crow laws. But um, that'll be in the Reconstruction era, uh, which has happened after this. 
the, uh, someone asked uh, what happens after the Civil War. It's called the Reconstruction Era, where the North basically tries to rebuild the South, but also get rid of slavery at the same time. And just the one huge summary of it is just, it completely didn't work yeah. and nothing changed. So I just included this slide because I want to say some things. Big disclaimer is that the Civil War was actually not really fought over slavery because Lincoln actually never wanted to get rid of slavery. He was part of a political party called the Free Soilers, and their main goal was to stop slavery from spreading and not to get rid of it. They, Lincoln only went to like go fight the war because he wanted to keep the Union together. And yeah, basically, um, the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, why it didn't actually get rid of slavery, is because, like Alan said, the South didn't have to listen to the North. And also, the North can't just like constantly like be staring at the South. So the South kind of had could do whatever they want, even after the Civil War, where the South lost. So the South, although African Americans had like voting rights, civil rights, equal rights, whatever, 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 the South basically said, we're not going to give you those rights and basically passed a bunch of their own laws, which made it so that African Americans could not vote and were still oppressed. And technically, there was actually still slavery because the th 13th Amendment says no slavery except for criminals. Criminals can actually be slaves. So what the South basically did is uh, they gave African Americans a bunch of like fake crimes. Like they basically just pinned a bunch of fake crimes on them and basically turned, sent them back to slavery. Like that's what happened a lot of times. Cause like slavery was technically still legal uh, for like criminal reasons. And also Missouri, I think still had slaves cause it, the Emancipation Proclamation only got rid of slavery below. Like um, and from uh, only got rid of slavery from all the seceding states and not actually every single state. And yeah, the South, um, they, they argued that the war was about states' rights, but that's actually completely not true. And the South didn't want to keep slaves fully for economic reasons, actually, because in the beginning of this like um, history lesson, we said that the North was industrializing a lot, like any new technology and whatnot. So there was definitely a lot of like farm technology being developed, and the South could have industrialized too and get like all those like fancy machines and like farm a lot faster, but the South didn't really want to, like they wanted to stick to their tradition and culture. And basically they seceded because they didn't want the North to like manage them and they wanted the North to stay out of their business. And yeah, the North technically, they claimed that they were fighting slavery for moral reasons, but that's like completely, not completely, but like pretty much not true. Cause there's like, like 50 years later, there's something called the Gilded Age, which is just, an age where America is essentially ruled by big corporations who basically oppress like most of the population, aka the worker class. And they could, because like the worker class, they basically work like 15 hours a day and paid like $1. Like that's completely, that's basically slavery, if you ask me. So yeah, the North technically also had slaves too. Like the North wasn't a good place by any means just because they were getting rid of slavery. Uh, is, there's no questions, then we're moving on to our final lesson, which is physics. So are there any questions? No? Okay. So final lesson today, physics, we'll be doing rotational kinematics. So rotational kinematics is actually very similar to linear kinematics. Like from the equation table on the bottom, you can see that even the equations are very similar. The, vari the variables do change though. Like you can see that velocity and angular velocity have two different variables. Regular velocity is V, whereas angular velocity is a W. And then angular acceleration is technically not an A, it looks like an A, but you can see that like extra like cursiveness to it, I guess. Like it's, it looks like it's a cursive A, right? Like, so yeah, that's the difference. And then you no longer have distance. Well, you still have distance, but it's like now it's been changed to that like, uh, circle thing because it's like you're like spinning in a circle now and you know how like if you ever done like trigonometry you know that's like angles so yeah there's still angular velocity acceleration momentum and kinetic energy one new concept though in rotational kinematics is torque but that's basically a angular force it just called something new 
So yeah, and then if you look on the table on the bottom, these are like kind of like the four big kinematic equations. And then you can see the standard ones on the left, like you, everyone who does physics will know these. And then the ones on the right are like the rotational versions of them. And you can see that they're very, very similar. So another new thing is moment of inertia. So if you, you all know inertia from Newton's first law, right? Like Newton's first law states that any object that has mass has inertia and that inertia is what like uh, determines how hard it is to like change a velocity of an object, right? So it's the same thing here in rotational kinematics. The moment of inertia tells us how difficult it is to change the rotational velocity of the object. And then it's represented by the variable I and the equation is I equals half MR squared. So what does that mean? Uh, M is the mass of an object. And then R is like the radius of an object. So if you have like a hoop versus the disc, um, the hollow hoop has more moment of inertia than the disc, assuming they both have the same mass because a uh, moment of inertia depends on the radius of the object, right? If all your mass is on the outside of the object, that means it's like the rate it's like furthest from the center point, right? That means there's like a lot of like like it's like the radius is like right. It's a bit hard to explain, but like, uh, whereas the disc is like the mass is spread throughout, right? So not all of it has like not all of it's on the farthest end of the circle, right? So that's why a hoop has more moment of inertia than uh, a disc, despite them having the same um, mass. Is because radius here uh, deter also helps determine how much moment of inertia an object has. So why is moment of inertia important? Is because rotational momentum depends on it. So rotational momentum is represented by the variable L. So normal momentum, we know it as P, right? P equals MV. Here it's gonna be L for rotational. And the equation is equal to IW. So moment of inertia times angular velocity. So, there's also a change in momentum equation. So you know how normally like change in momentum is impulse. Uh, here, change in angular momentum is equal to torque times the change in time. So it's really similar to um, impulse because impulse is force times the change in time. But now we're we have an angular force, which is just torque. So it's torque times the change in time, and that gives you the change in momentum. And then, so what is torque? Torque is the measure of the force that can cause an object to rotate about an axis. So the equation is RF sine theta. And then, uh, in the, for like the, you see two equations, right? R and then the funny sine F, and then you see RF sine theta. So that funny sign just tells you that means it has to be perpendicular. So torque has to be perpendicular to the surface of an object in order to do anything. So we can see a diagram on the right here, and I'll do some annotations. Uh, okay. So this force right here and this force will change the angular velocity of the uh of the disc, right? Or like the yeah. But this one okay, right here, this one, which has an arrow pointing to it, right? Green arrow, this one doesn't actually do anything because if you just like punch a disc straight up, it's not gonna it's not going to spin. You have to apply a force perpendicular to the circular object in order for it to rotate. If you push directly at it, you're only going to make it go forwards. So you're not going to make it spin. So any force that has, that's like uh, directly at the circular object, no matter how big it is, the torque is still zero. Or like, the, yeah, because like, the, or like the, because here's sine theta, right? So you know that if it's like uh, sine zero degrees or sine 180 degrees, uh, that's equal to zero. So no matter how big your force is, R times your force times zero still equals zero. So if you're perpendicular, then that would be sine 90 degrees, which equals one, if you know your trigonometry. So one times the radius times whatever force you have would give you a positive torque. And so your velocity would actually be changing. So uh, here's one really kind of like, confusing thing in rotational kinematics is that counterclockwise is positive and clockwise is negative. Now, most people would think that's like really weird because if you normally it's like when you move to the right, 
it's positive or when you go up, that's positive. But here we're like going the opposite way because counterclockwise is kind of like going to the left and now that's positive. So just remember counterclockwise is positive, clockwise is negative. And then how you can remember that is if you take like a thumbs up, right? And then you point that towards yourself, like make your thumbs up, point it towards yourself. And then you can curve your wrist. The direction that you curve your wrist is counterclockwise, right? Like with your right hand, always use your right hand, not your left hand. Use your right hand, make a thumbs up, point it towards yourself and then curve your like, wrist. The way you curve your wrist is counterclockwise. And that means it tells you that counterclockwise is positive. And because you can't really move your wrist clockwise because like you physically can't or like you could sort of, but not really. That's how you know clockwise is negative. So that's kind of a good way to memorize it's that counterclockwise is negative, positive, clockwise is negative. So rotate and then onto rotational kinetic energy. So rotational kinetic energy or angular kinetic energy is the kinetic energy due to the rotation of an object and is part of its total kinetic energy. So the equation is half IW squared, which is basically moment of inertia times velocity squared and half that. So an object like a bicycle, right? Because like a bicycle has wheels, but it's also moving forward would have both linear and rotational kinetic energy when moving. And you have to combine both the kinetic energies to find the total kinetic energy. So like you can see on the diagram on the right that like if this ball would be moving forwards, it would have both regular kinetic energy, like linear kinetic energy, which is just half mv squared, but it also have rotational kinetic energy, which is half iw squared. And you'd have to like calculate for both those values and then add them together. And that would give you your total kinetic energy. So something like, like, let's say a box that doesn't spin when moving would not have rotational kinetic energy and would only have linear kinetic energy. So you would only have to combine the two kinetic energies when you have an object that's moving forward or backwards or whatever and spinning at the same time. Okay, so that's the end of today's lesson. If you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself or ask them in the chat and this, there's a google form here uh, for feedback we'd highly appreciate it if you could give us some feedback and yeah any questions no y'all understand this that's good i guess so uh, the links to the Feedback form is right here. Maybe someone can post that in the chat so that people can access it. And thank you all for coming today.